after nearly five years in captivity. Their son, Bo, is coming home. A dangerous concession or a necessary step to achieve peace. A U.S. soldier is freed by the Taliban in exchange for five of its leaders. But what are the implications of negotiating with armed groups and what sort of precedent does it set? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mike Hanna. U.S. President Barack Obama has been defending his decision to negotiate, albeit indirectly, with the Taliban. Obama has traded five Taliban leaders being held in Guantanamo Bay for the only American prisoner of war in Afghanistan. The deal for the release of Sergeant Bo Bergdahl was mediated by Qatar. Obama said it was part of the U.S.'s commitment to bringing prisoners of war home. We've worked for several years to achieve this goal, and earlier this week I was able to personally thank the Emir of Qatar for his leadership in helping us get it done. As part of this effort, the United States is transferring five detainees from the prison in Guantanamo Bay to Qatar. The Qatari government has given us assurances that it will put in place measures to protect our national security. We're committed to winding down the war in Afghanistan, and we are committed to closing Gitmo. But we also made an ironclad commitment to bring our prisoners of war home. That's who we are as Americans. It's a profound obligation within our military. And today, at least in this instance, it's a promise we've been able to keep. Well, others in Washington are warning of a dangerous precedent. The chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, Republican Congressman Mike Rogers, said the fundamental shift in U.S. policy signals to terrorists around the world a greater incentive to take U.S. hostages. And he went on, I believe this decision will threaten the lives of American soldiers for years to come. Well, Army Sergeant Bo Bergdahl was captured in Paktika province in Afghanistan on June the 30th, 2009, the only known missing American soldier in the Afghan war. During his captivity, he was seen in videotapes released by the Taliban. Metal identification dog tags are shown. Bergdahl is also heard explaining how he was captured after lagging behind his army patrol. In another video, he appeals for his release. I'm a prisoner. I want to go home. You know, the, the men, the Afghanistan men who are in our prisons, they want to go home too. It's... Just let me go, let, get me to come home, release me, get, you know, e every day I want to go home. It do the pain in my heart to see my family again doesn't get any smaller. Well, Qatar has been at the heart of mediating talks with the Taliban. The group's first official overseas office was briefly opened in Doha in June last year. Qatar's foreign minister has given few details about the latest deal, other than it was for humanitarian reasons. I thank the negotiating delegation who adopted the best practices and with respect to the details, excuse me for not disclosing any. However, when Qatar takes the role of intermediary, it plays this role on a humanitarian basis, which is the whole concept of Qatar foreign relations. Well, the five Taliban detainees had all been held in Guantanamo Bay since 2002. They were part of the Afghan leadership before the U.S.-led invasion in 2001. Mohammad Fazi was the deputy minister of defense and also a senior commander of the Taliban army. Kairula Karkwa was served as a minister of interior, was directly associated with Osama bin Laden. Abdul Haq Wasik, the Deputy Minister of Intelligence, was central in forming alliances between the Taliban and other groups. Mullah Nurullah Nuri was a senior military commander during fighting against the U.S. and coalition forces in late 2001. And Mohammad Nabi served in multiple leadership roles. He's also suspected of having strong links to al-Qaeda. So how does President Obama handle two fundamental principles? No negotiation with armed groups versus leave no man behind. Well, let's bring in our guests. 
With me here is David Roberts, lecturer in Defence Studies at King's College London, based in Qatar, and author of the book, Qatar, Securing the Global Ambitions of a City-State. Joining us from Kabul is Dawood Sultansoy, a former Afghan member of parliament and presidential candidate. And in Washington, we have Mark Kimmett, a former U.S. State Department official and retired Brigadier General. Welcome to you all. Let's begin with Mark Kimmett in Washington. Well, we've heard part of the uh, reaction. What sort of precedent does this set? Well, it doesn't really set any precedent. I, I typically am in disagreement with this administration on its policy in Afghanistan. But as regards to this being something new, something precedent shattering, uh, that's simply not the case. We saw with the release of the hostages in Lebanon in the 80s, with the release and exchange of Michael Duran and Smalley in the 90s, uh, this type of activity has happened before. And all those that would suggest that the world is going to fall apart because we exchange prisoners for an American soldier, uh, I think that's a bit hyperbolic. Well, David Roberts, uh, your, your view, how much of a precedent do you think it is? I'm sorry, sir, I agree entirely. I mean, I, I'm from the UK. I mean, for definitional issues aside, we've been negotiating with terrorists for a number of years. I mean, it's worked out relatively well, the Good Friday Agreement and so on. And it's not as if it's just America or the UK, Spain, ETA. This is something that happens. Administrations, they deny it, but of course they need, they need uh, links and, and discussions with, with these groups at all times. Well, uh, Dal Saltanzoy, uh, what, what has been the reaction in Kabul to this deal? Uh, well, the reaction has been, uh, uh, I think, very well received. Uh, the news was very well received uh, because, after all, wars dehumanize uh, human face and uh, releasing human beings, uh, 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 de-escalating uh, the rhetorical aspects of war and bringing confidence-building measures are always good, and Afghanistan has uh, been the victim of many wars for too long. And if this can create a new momentum towards peace, uh, creating confidence-building uh, path that is much needed, then, of course, it's good, and the people of Afghanistan are hoping that that's what it would do. Mark Kimmett, let's get another thing out of the way. I mean, critics are contending that the threat level to Americans, both in, in and out of uniform around the world, has risen substantially uh, with this prisoner uh, deal. What's your opinion of that? Well, I, I think that some will see this as an opportunity for a quid pro quo by kidnapping an American, they can get some of their prisoners released. And to that extent, there is reason to be concerned that this risk has gone up significantly. Uh, nonetheless, to suggest that this is something new, uh, we didn't see after the prisoner exchange the, the, the of uh, uh, our prisoner in Somalia or in the fact of what happened in Lebanon. We didn't see that. So I think as a matter of precedent, we don't want to be doing this as uh, uh, routinely, but I think there are exceptions where these types of exchanges can be helpful without dramatic risk uh, or unacceptable risk in the future. Well, Dal Sultan, sorry, let's take a look at, at, at some of the, the kind of nuts and bolts of this particular deal. At no stage we hear from the U.S. administration was the Afghan government informed of the imminent release of the Afghan captives. Is that going to be an issue in Kabul? Uh, I think uh, the, the biggest thing that we should pay attention to is the, the Taliban have always uh, indicated that they will uh, like to talk to the Americans directly and this shows that they were able to do that and the American government also uh, with help from Qatar which is a new reassertion of Qatar in the in the role that they were sidelined from after the embassy incident I think uh, we should expect that the Taliban have achieved something that uh, they were looking for which was direct negotiations with the United States and uh, a weak Afghan government shouldn't have expected any more, any much, anything uh, more than what they saw. Uh, a government that was not able to create any momentum uh, for their role in peace and peace building. But nonetheless, uh, the role of the government of Afghanistan is not the key issue. The role is, uh, the, the important issue is peace and confidence building measures such as this is good for peace and that's what we should go after and uh, bring a peace that is uh, acceptable to the people of Afghanistan and uh, acceptable to the region and uh, enhances the security of the region and the security of the world 
uh, at large. Well, David Roberts, I just want to pick up on something there that was referred to as that mm -hmm. embassy incident. Uh, mm -hmm. That is uh, an event last year after Taliban had opened the office in Doha. Do, do you, could you just explain exactly what happened at that particular time? It ended up being, being something of a mess, to be perfectly honest. Negotiations for an unspecified period of time led to, I think it was in maybe June 2013, just last year, last summer, um, the embassy opening. But maybe it wasn't supposed to be called an embassy. It was supposed to be called an office. So on the day, there was a bit of ceremony. It was described as an embassy. There was a flag. There was uh, anthems and these sorts of things. All the things which were very clearly new to some of the protagonists, including, of course, um, the American government. And so the office opened on the morning, and within you know a few hours, the flagpole was cut down. It's, and within a few days, the whole venture seemed to just stop. I mean, even at the time, although it did clearly stop, and, and at the, the uh, embassy, or rather the office, wasn't functioning, this kind of back-channel activity, I think, was always going to continue. Um, and this, I suppose, is the fruit thereof. Yes, well, Mark Kimmett, I mean, Rocky, beginnings to that particular role being played by Qatar in terms of giving a venue to Taliban groups within this uh, particular country. And yet this whole issue of using the intermediary, using the interlocutor, this would appear to be a, a, a certainly a critical phase in securing the release of uh, the U.S. prisoner of war, is it not? Uh, uh, I, I absolutely agree. Some of the comments uh, thus far have seemed to be internally inconsistent because this whole notion of negotiating with terrorists, and if you do that, what will happen in the future, uh, is not borne out by history. But one thing that we should be very grateful for, and that is the role that the Emir of Qatar has played, like Sweden and Switzerland during the Second World War and other intermediary nations uh, in other wartime periods, uh, this would not have happened without the intercession of the Emir of Qatar. And I think if there's anything that's, that's clear cut in this entire episode is that this would not have happened without their intercession. So we should all be grateful for what they've accomplished. Uh, uh, David Roberts, is this perhaps part of a grander plan, a grander design that is not going to stop at negotiating the release of prisoners? Well, I suppose that there's two angles to this. There's a grander design in terms of Afghanistan and America and the war, and there's the grander design from, from the Qatari perspective. In, t in terms of Qatar, this is, a, this is right in the sweet spot of what they want to do. They want to be a positive interlocutor between important states and no more important states like other than, of course, America, and these groups with whom America and other Western allies find difficult, difficulty in dealing. So the Taliban is, of course, the perfect example. Similar ones in Hamas and Hezbollah, of course. This is what Qatar wants to do. And this is about augmenting Qatar's importance to these countries. So this is a, something of a strategic policy of the state, and this will go forward. In terms of you know, the American-Afghan negotiations going forward, I mean, I'll, I'll defer to my colleague in Kabul, but it's, I would presume that this is there is a certain amount of positive impetus into the process, but I would be surprised if this changed the fundamental strategic calculation. The Taliban can wait. They are waiting. They know that America is leaving extremely soon. There's no real need for them to make concessions. I don't think it changes that particular calculus. Yes, well, uh, Dal Sultan, sorry for you to pick up on that. Uh, we've actually heard uh, from a White House uh, official, unnamed, who was quoted as saying that there's the hope that this will create the possibility of expanding the dialogue to other issues. So certainly from the Obama administration, the view that this could be the beginning of a perhaps more regular uh, in, 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 a discussions via the intermediary with the Taliban? I think this will depend on what uh, the election of Afghanistan will bring and also the Taliban uh, made uh, this very clear with this step that uh, after the US announcement of withdrawal in 2016 uh, the Taliban immediately uh, showed that they are able to uh, take part in a give and take and they indicated, uh, and subliminally, they just showed the, uh, that they have achieved at least, or they're close to achieving what they were demanding, which was the total U.S. withdrawal. And since that is on the horizon, therefore, they're taking this step. But nevertheless, this is a good step if the Taliban would look at it as a strategic opportunity to get involved in the political process. But if, they're use it, if they use it as a tactical uh, gain, 
and not pursue the momentum that is created by this uh, towards peace, then they will lose uh, the support that would be created otherwise if they pursued a poli uh, otherwise uh, in pursuing a political process and joining the peace process. Well, Mark Kimmett, once again, just returning to the kind of nuts and bolts and the specifics of this particular deal, uh, no confirmation yet, but there have been reports uh, that the captured U.S. prisoner of war was actually being held by the Haqqani network um, in the uh, uh, tribal areas of Pakistan. Now, this is something that raises issues as well, because now you have another player moving into this, uh, the question of Taliban passing on um, it, prisoners to its allies as such is is something that uh, could complicate f f future scenarios and is actually something that is not being addressed uh, directly addressed at this point no i think that's right and uh, i don't necessarily see the actions of the taliban as somehow being a step towards peace or a step towards reconciliation it would it would for by most observers it would suggest that the taliban see their positioning strengthening with the departure of the americans and they are going to become less and less willing to compromise and to negotiate. They see themselves as taking the upper hand, and especially if they can get support from the Haqqani network and other Taliban networks inside of Pakistan, I think we're going to see the next couple of years a more hardline approach on the part of the Taliban and much less willing to negotiate or become part of a political process that they see as inherently corrupt. Well, uh, Dar Sultan, uh, sorry, uh, we, we heard from David Roberts a, a few minutes ago about the Taliban can just wait. They are waiting. They are waiting for the final withdrawal of U.S. forces, which will, in fact, be by the end of uh, 2015, according to the Obama administration, some 9,000 soldiers being left in there through next year. Is that, in fact, the case? Is it just a question of the Taliban waiting? Incidents like this, no real cause for optimism of a greater degree of dialogue? Well... Well, I, I think uh, there's a very, very uh, important difference that is happening uh, uh, in Afghanistan with the new government. If we have a good government that will replace this weak government, the Taliban that uh, were using as an excuse to take the stand that they have taken and just uh, go it alone and uh, take advantage of every opportunity and just be militant and not uh, give in. That was the case in the past 11, 12 years. And the weak Afghan government uh, created that void in which the Taliban were able to get away with these kinds of things. Uh, so I, naturally, looking at the Taliban and their behavior, one would expect that they will continue such thing. But at the same time, if you look at the behavior of the Afghan nation in the past election and the change of political and social climate in Afghanistan and the fatigue that has been created by the Taliban behavior uh, in, the, in the villages and in the uh, provinces of Afghanistan, uh, it will be uh, a risky thing if ca Taliban continued this uh, behavior. I think it will behoove the Taliban to change their posture and adjust to the new era that Afghanistan is trying to open a new door for their future and take advantage of this as an opportunity. Otherwise, if, if they behave the same way that they have had in the past, and if we have a good government that will replace this anemic government, then the people of Afghanistan will not support the Taliban's behavior and they will lose uh, the support that, that they've been gaining due to the behavior of a weak government. So the Taliban behavior should be very calculated in terms of uh, what they see in, Af in the changes that happening in Afghanistan, not in what they have behaved in the past. They should look at the new era, not the past, as they have in the past. Uh, David Roberts, it's just once again looking at the people who have been released into the care of the mm. Qatari authorities, five very senior ranking Taliban officers by all accounts. What kind of guarantees would Qatar give in terms of the security? We've heard President Obama say, well, the national interest of the U.S. is guaranteed by uh, the Qataris in terms of mm. taking care of these five men. What sort of guarantees have been given, do you believe? Thus far, the only one we really know is that apparently there's a, at least a year um, in situ before the, in, in Doha before they can leave. This is the only one that's clear, aside from notions that they will be under some sort of surveillance uh, by the Qataris and I'm sure the, the Americans as well, to be honest. But this isn't the first time that Qatar has, has played this exact kind of a role. 
in the late 2000s when they were trying to negotiate in Yemen, bring some sort of a, a peace deal there with the Houthis, part of the deal they were offering was for the Houthi leadership to come to Doha. When, you know, in the, in the early 2000s, they had a Chechen warlord here who the Russians eventually assassinated in 2004. So that doesn't bode well for, for a, a peaceful um, continuation of this situation. But the, Qatar has this reputation that, that it's earned over the years as this sort of a neutral ground. I mean, that's not exactly the right way to phrase it. But this idea of Doha as a place where people can come and th these gentlemen will be here for, for at least a year. Um, and the Qataris will, will keep an eye on them. It's, they've got some experience in it, at least. Well, Mark, Mark Kimmett, another issue to all of this is, of course, spotlighting once again Guantanamo. Uh, that was the place that President Obama said was going to be shut down. His first action uh, on taking office six years ago was signing an order uh, closing it down. One of the problems has been finding an alternative venue, a venue with which uh, the lawmakers within the U.S. and others are uh, absolutely assured that is safe. Is this a beginning, perhaps, of something a little bit wider, of Doha being that alternative venue to allow Guantanamo to be shut down? Well, I, I certainly think it's going to depend on how well Doha is able to control the activities of these five very, very dangerous prisoners that have been released into their custody. Uh, but what has really caused the maintaining of Gitmo as a site for some of these prisoners is, uh, it sounds wonderful on the election trail to say you're going to close Guantanamo, but when the facts of the crimes and the facts of the danger that the prisoners that you have in Guantanamo are put on your desk, you recognize that it's a very, very uh, unsavory group of people that are down there, and to release these without any kind of assurance that uh, their activities are going to be monitored is something no president can uh, undertake uh, except under some very, very strict uh, provisions by a third country. I think we're going to regret the day we release these prisoners the way that Saudi Arabia has regretted releasing some hardened terrorists from their custody. The amount of recidivism that we've seen by battle leaders such as the five that have been released to Doha, uh, the record is not strong that these people are going to return uh, to a normal life, but they will probably end up back in the battlefield and become a direct threat not only to the United States but to the Afghani people as well. Well, Donald uh, Sultan's way on that particular point, the assumption is that after uh, the year wait here in Qatar, uh, these men will be returning to Afghanistan. What kind of a welcome are they going to get there? Well, uh, uh, naturally, these kinds of situations uh, uh, make these kinds of people more prominent in their own uh, constituencies that are the Taliban. But at the same time, uh, the five years in prison or longer, I guess, uh, uh, for the U.S. Uh, servicemen and much longer for these guys, uh, many things have happened on the ground. I agree with the previous guest that uh, they could pose a lot of uh, threats to the Afghans and to the uh, U.S. interest and others, but at the same time, uh, we have to look uh, towards another angle in this war. Uh, we should create a, a, an opportunity where peace prevails and the momentum towards peace will negate the ability for these kinds of people to play as they have been with the lives of others and the opportunities that others are seeking. And I'm sure with the new assertion that Qatari government has uh, displayed in this case, they are capable of uh, continuing their pressure on the Taliban. The other, uh, rest of the Arab world can play their role and uh, make sure that this region at large becomes uh, an opportunity zone for all of us because Qatar is, uh, is a very strategic uh, country in the region and they have strategic goals. Well, very quickly, David Roberts, it uh, does appear that Qatar is going to do that. We do seem to be entering a different time now. Um, the, the new mayor so had almost a full year in charge, and there seems to be something of a general change of tack. The more eye-catching policies of yesteryear this being something of an exception, back to the old days, as it were. But there does seem to be a slightly different, more reserved tenor afoot. Well, at that particular point, my thanks to our guests, Daoud Sultanzoy, Mark Kimmett, and David Roberts. And thank you for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. You can follow this discussion online at facebook.com slash AJ Inside Story or go to at AJ Inside Story on Twitter. 
I'm Mike Hanna. Thanks for watching and goodbye for now.